All right, and now we're going to do something different. Um, my name is Reese McKay, and I come from the research field. And I was asked to come and talk to you guys about uh, an end user's experience of using these sites. Um, I'm very honored by the opportunity to represent a field that I'm very proud of uh, and that I spent many years in. I'm not currently in the field. I left a few months ago to work for HEB Grocery Company. Uh, any South Texans here? One? Two? All right. Well, I called in sick today, so keep quiet. Um, I do still have loose affiliations with Yale, uh, the Hartford Hospital, and the University of Texas Health Science Center. Uh, and so I am still involved in this arena, but I have uh, much less skin in the game, so to speak. Um, and I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. I'm not here for, for any particular group. Um, very briefly, uh, the field that I worked in was uh, imaging genetics. Uh, we acquire brain images and whole genome sequence data in massive families, and our sample sizes are usually up over 1,000 people. Uh, it's, it's a very diverse, interactive field, and um, I'm telling you this uh, so that you realize that we need organizational frameworks. We need uh, platforms like these to interact with our peers, and they facilitate uh, what we do and things that um, oftentimes we're oblivious to that we should not be. Uh, so beyond me and the field that I worked in, uh, who's publishing these research articles? Uh, we see a general Western trend uh, like you would see in many of these plots where countries um, like the U.S. in particular and the U.K. Uh, and Western Europe have bloated beyond their geographical uh, footprints. And beyond that, uh, unless you're Japan, uh, you're, you're really not. So, uh, and we have a general um, uh, gender bias, uh, which, which we which we can expect in this field, and um, that, that's lessening drastically, but it's still present. Uh, and of these researchers that slave away at this stuff, what are they making? Um, they're not making a whole lot, and it's not changing a whole lot throughout the course of their career. So the picture that I'm painting for you is, is someone that more or less gets, uh, gets into a field they're very passionate about, and they work very hard in the field, and they're going after tenure, and they're establishing tenure and uh, not really paying a whole lot of attention to things beyond their particular lab or their group. Uh, it's just part of the culture and is a, is a tunnel visioned group and it's not necessarily a badge of honor but it's absolutely the way that things exist. Uh, and so I was looking at this and I was thinking, you know, this is you know, dismal pay for someone who's been in a field for this long and all of this and it's, the sad thing is that it really doesn't show uh, the actual hours spent uh, so as some anecdotal evidence of the number of hours spent, uh, put the top there, cut off a little bit. These are the top 15 heaviest coffee drinking professions. Uh, number one, no doubt, scientist, lab technician. Number four, editor, writer. Uh, number eight, professor. So we have three of the top eight that are very heavily tied to uh, sort of our core competency and traits to, to maintain in these fields. So uh, to ride that curve... Uh, that I showed to up to the somewhat dismal uh, salary trajectory. Uh, what does a researcher do to stay employed? How do we keep our job? Well, it's a vicious cycle of publishing and getting grants and iterate, repeat, do it again and again and again. Uh, within publications, uh, the, how often you publish and the frequency of your publications is very key. The impact factor of the journals uh, that we publish in is very key, as well as the journal reputation. Uh, those don't always continue to go hand in hand. A uh, classic example right now is uh, PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Their impact factor is down below nine, but it's still a very prestigious journal that will definitely stick out on a CV. Uh, and all this feeds into grants and our reputation and how we're able to get more money to keep this cycle going. Primarily in academic research, we'll be funded by the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, or the Department of Defense here in America. Um, or, you know, if we're lucky enough to work with a private group, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, some other groups uh, are really up and comers. Now, uh, because this is what pretty much anyone would tell you how you keep a job in academia. Um, I don't think I'd get many arguments, but this revolves around core skills that actually enable everything around it. And there's very little uh, 
uh, emphasis or attention paid to what the actual skills are that go into the publications and go into the grants. And as, as these, are, these fields that we work in become increasingly more interdisciplinary, the attention paid to those skills uh, and, and how you actually contribute to the publications and grants is, is way more important. Um, and it's, it's really in this upper half of this quadrant here between publications and then the core competency skills that uh, a, lot of, a lot of these uh, scholarly collaboration networks have really, really been able to key in and give us things that we need. So uh, what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of uh, an experience that I would go through when I went through, uh, when I would just click on my ResearchGate profile page and go through what's been going on. Um, I started this profile in 2009, about six months after the site was launched. And I remember sitting and waiting for my first paper to actually be accepted so I would start a profile that wasn't blank, uh, that I could actually put a paper on. Uh, and and it, it does grow. So um, just, just the sort of key components of the site, um, <clears throat> as, as Mark showed, you know, we're way more likely to put a picture up now, show you what we actually look like. Um, you, you have some skills here that you can click on and drop down and see some resume type things. Uh, as well as is these sort of uh, global stats that they'll put down here at the bottom. Um, and I want to draw your attention to a couple of little toolbars here. One is up at the top, and one is right here in the middle. And the next few slides we'll go through and show you just a little bit about uh, what these different buttons within this toolbar do, starting with this one. So one thing that uh, ResearchGate has put into place is an RG score, a ResearchGate score, based on the number of publications, number of questions, number of answers you've contributed, and how many people uh, are following you. It's really fun to publish a paper and see it hit press and see it get cited and see your score go up. I'm not sure this score means anything to anybody. I don't know that anyone has ever received a job because of their ResearchGate score, and to be perfectly honest, the only time I've seen it on a resume is when someone from a far foreign land thinks that we're going to appreciate seeing a ResearchGate score. Um, you can break down what contributes to your score uh, by the bar graph at the bottom. You can see that since I left academia about three months ago, my score has been pretty stagnant. Um, all of the bright yellow down here is from publications, and this little green bit at the top here is from uh, questions that I've answered. So this completely echoes what Mark was putting up where people really don't have a lot of push and pull of information and know-how on the sites even though there is infrastructure there. Uh, you can see how you stack up compared to most users um, and you can find out all sorts of details about your scores if you would wish to. Um, to me this level of interaction and tracking yourself uh, at this stage is a little bit uh, narcissistic and maybe tunnel visioned, uh, but this is the tunnel visioned world that we live in where we publish papers and we hope that they get cited and downloaded and read and this will bring all the facts together for you. Uh, this will show me exactly how many times my papers have been downloaded, viewed, um, cited, and it'll even tell me who has been downloading them if they are fully registered and logged in, so, and so on and so forth. It'll also tell me who's downloading uh, papers by country, uh, similar, similar to what Richard showed. Um, a few different things that have, have definitely become metrics that we just didn't have before sites like this. Um, profile views and publication views. Everybody was kind of doing their own little spin-offs, having their own little lab web pages. They could host some papers, you know, put things up and link to it if they wanted to, but there was no real uh, repository where this stuff would be collected. And so telling someone that your paper's been viewed 20,000 times in 1985 probably wouldn't even jive with someone. Now you tell someone that and they know that there's actually a, a way that this, stores, this stuff can be tracked. Um, if I were to click over on the next button on this arrow bar called info. Uh, it would tell me info about myself. So what have other people in my research field say, uh, said online that I am good at? And if they say I'm good at it, then their picture shows up here. I would say that this is extremely underutilized. Uh, I don't know of people looking for 
someone with a particular bit of skill that will go to ResearchGate and pull up that skill set and say, okay, here's my candidates. Uh, and if you look, um, these are my lab mates. So this is the same person that endorsed me for all these skills. This is the same guy that endorsed me for all these skills. And then I've got a bunch of one-offs here that may just be random. Um, so, you know, you can have 23 endorsements or so, but it's, it, it doesn't necessarily inform the greater bit of my, my skill within a lab. Uh, if I were to click this next button over, this contributions button, this contributions button is something that I probably use more than any other feature on these sites, and that is just keeping a collated, organized version uh, list of my publications with all the authors and all their affiliations and everything uh, keyed in so that I can access it when I need to. Uh, there are CV creators on these sites, so I can click a button on here and have it create a resume for me based on the information that I've uploaded. And with that, it'll systematically format the publications. So it keeps me from having to go through and change semicolons to commas or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, this is also nice. So up here at the top, it says, one publication was recently added to your profile. Review updates. Uh, especially since this hasn't been my day job, I stopped you know, looking at PubMed, stopped looking at when publications hit the press, that sort of thing. And what will happen is one, some, a co-author of mine will write a paper that gets submitted. Uh, if I contributed to it in some way, I may not have reviewed it or even known that it was in press, but I'll get an alert on here. Um, the flip side of that is if you don't want to be included on something and you can see that you are included, it gives you a means of kind of keeping track of that without just aimlessly Googling. Um, one more thing I'd like to point out on this slide, um, because we're going to get into mining this author list here in a moment. This sort of 8 to 10 to 12 author list, uh, length author list, was pretty standard um, up until, I don't know, six, seven years ago. It still happens quite a bit to have an author list length of this long, but they're also much, much longer. So if you see down here on this bottom author list, they just stop after 10 or so authors and put dot, dot, dot. And then they list multiple consortia that also contributed to this particular publication. Well, if you look at that publication, at the very end of all of the uh, cite, uh, articles that they cited, they list who the contributing authors were. So an author list of 20, uh, I'm sorry, an author list of 350, 400 authors is not uncommon now. When we have sample sizes, 75,000, 85,000 people, and you have studies that have taken place all over the world, everybody wants to make sure their name is on it. Um, the trouble with this is that when platforms use an author list like this to build my network, I end up getting email alerts and all sorts of info about people that I have no idea who they are. Um, new publications from them, uh, things, things that were cited, um, stuff that's gone on based on the mining of that author list that don't actually reflect things that I'm actually involved in. Uh, and that's just a factor of having gone through and used that author list like it's the people that I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this is just something that we kind of come to expect. If this were a Facebook sort of interaction, I would certainly expect to see when I was tagged in something, just the crossover of that. So with that, we see these things that I'm just going to call social norms here. And so we're encouraged to follow people, to have followers, for them to tell us about them and all of that. And when you navigate the ResearchGate website, you really feel like you are on a social network website. Who's been doing this? Who's posted this? Who's following what? Who's not? Lots of pictures of them and all of that. Uh, when you looked at Richard's demo, I think you see that, I think you saw that it's very content forward. So you have a flat white background, you have your wireframes, you have the scientific content. In this, uh, in this environment, it is more of a social network, what's going on with my friends in the science world. Um, two really useful things that ResearchGate has put into place are uh, opportunities for job postings and the Q&A that they have up here. So once, or, once a week or so, I get an email that tells me jobs that are available that fit my relative skill sets. Um, I've filled out the profile to some degree, not very much. It's telling me that if I filled out more of the profile, then I could get better suggestions. 
Uh, and I'd say that's absolutely cru- true because I'm nowhere near director level and I don't have an MD. So I haven't done a very good job of getting these uh, recommendations to be accurate, but they're the, the impetus is spot on. The other thing that I think they do really well, uh, despite the fact that it's not heavily used, is the question and answer section. We drastically need more ways to interact with one another in the scientific world. We're terrible about getting into our lab, looking at our computer, our Petri dish, whatever's in front of us, and not interacting with anyone unless we absolutely have to. Um, a Q&A session where I could throw up a question about something that I'm not sure about. Hey, I just got some new samples. What's the best in situ hybridization for these? Um, this guy is asking about a very technical image processing tool on here, and he wants to know why his results are different. Things like this where he can interact without either having to go to his boss's door or without having to go and ask someone that he may be competing with, something like that, uh, and actually get answers is, is hugely helpful. Um, so I went around and asked a number of people what they thought about using these and what they preferred and what they didn't. And I, I really don't want to be assigning scores here, but in general there was a lot of, there was not a, a lot of overlap between the two, ResearchGate and Academia, so I thought I'd go over these just a little bit. Um, the interactivity on ResearchGate is what people seem to enjoy that you, that, uh, of those people that actually used it. Um, the self-perpetuating record-keeping process, so the fact that my publication list will keep populating even though I'm not doing it, is also a nice advantage. Um, I had just as many people tell me they really liked the scoring metrics as people told me they didn't like the scoring metrics at all. One guy went in and immediately deleted his ResearchGate profile when the new score was formulated because he didn't want to be judged by him trying to share. I'm trying to share, don't judge my score, sort of thing. Um, people in general were very, very guarded about what level of censorship was taking places in the forums. Um, a number of people that I spoke to uh, come from countries that have uh, pretty invasive censorship laws, so anything being changed or edited or modified uh, in, in a scientific domain, they seem to be offended by. Um, on academia.edu, uh, the repository of publications allowing the user to link their paper to the actual uh, source. So, um, you know, if, if, my, if my paper is sitting on you know, some actual public publisher source site and I can link to that and they can get the paper directly from there, that seemed to be a huge advantage amongst users. Um, so apparently there are some users out there that care a little bit about copyright laws. Um, in general, uh, it seemed as though some co-authorship functionality was a little bit slow to be adopt adopted in academia.edu, but I've been told that that's fully going now. Uh, the sessions bit that uh, Richard went through where you can upload a document and actively review it with people, uh, that seems to be a really likable feature. Um, and again, with academia, just anything to do with censorship. You know, so They came in, I have no idea what this guy posted. Apparently he posted something that deemed his profile be deleted and had to go back and recreate one. Uh, I'd say pretty much any site where you can post something, some admin somewhere is going to have the ability to delete your, uh, your profile. People seem to be very sensitive about this. Um, as Mark went through, there are a number of smaller players in this field, uh, Mendeley, ReadCube, My Scientific Network, PubCrawler. These latter two will fulfill much smaller, um, smaller skills than what the broader sites will. PubCrawler will tell you who cites your papers week by week with no more information. Uh, so there are small little skills that uh, those, those sites can perform. And then, of course, because of how browser-centric and how much we use other tools, uh, how much we use Facebook, LinkedIn for other things, they have a window into the market sector as well, whether they're invited or not. One thing I think to keep in mind is that when you use these sites, it's very, very clear that they have distinct goals. Um, it's a clear goal of ResearchGate to increase the traffic on their site. Um, you can see that directly in their Alexa rank. The lower one's Alexa rank, the more traffic they get. Um, they send enough emails and send enough links out and enough social network type things going on that they generate a lot of clicks. Um, when you go over to academia.edu, 
um, you don't seem to have near the push to just visit the site. It's more of a place to go and exchange scientific content. And I think I might have a third of my papers on academia.edu. I did them, I uploaded them purely for the purpose of this talk, and I found myself in a little, little bit of a quandary. Um, when, all, when these sites came around in 2008, um, I didn't really even know how to think about social network sites, what their goals were, and what their design principles were. Now we think about things like that, so I prefer to have a nice white slate that's content heavy. I prefer not to have a whole bunch of pictures of people that are the same pictures every single day. Um, but back then, we didn't even really have that rubric in mind. So this is all, this is all sort of developing, and um, they're, they're welcome tools, and there's a, there's a place for all of them. I'd like to close just with some conclusions. Um, with all these web-based programs available, uh, I think in general they help the scientific community drastically. Um, whether we're, you know, whether we're sharing content, whether we're using them the same way that the developers intended for us to or not, uh, these are tools that we need and that we use on a daily basis. Um, generally speaking, how we interact with the sites are going to be need-based. You know, we're, not, we're not going to go out and do something for the good of the community when we're competing very hard with other people in that community. Um, data sharing initiatives, on that note, are very slow to catch on. NIH makes us share data. Uh, so if we have to share data, we tend to do it through NIH sites and not through these sort of uh, collaboration platforms. Uh, and lastly, uh, I'd just like to point out that the capabilities that are available on these uh, scholarly collaboration networks completely outstrip what we can communicate in traditional journals. Um, we do not interact with scientific articles in magazine format. Uh, the information is intrinsically not two-dimensional. Um, the number of voxels wide and tall a figure can be has no bearing on the scientific content that's actually in it. And when we go through and reformat and get all of our papers into the proper way that a journal wants to display them, it does remove us from the way that we intend for the science to be communicated in the first place. And if nothing else, these collaboration networks give us a window that we can put up the research in its uh, intrinsic space. So if it's 3D data, we can upload a 3D video. Um, if it's, you know, if it's uh, a massive poster-sized figure in order to get all this stuff in, we can get in there. We are not hindered. And so for these reasons, uh, I, I think that we'll continue to use them uh, even, if it's, even if it's not something that um, is super standardized or consistent across groups. Um, so I would like to use one of the ResearchGate tools here to acknowledge the scientists that have given me the opportunity to do this research. Um, so this is another tool that tells me how many papers I've published with each of these people and what their relative scores are. And these are the people that I've sat in the same room with for five or six years. Um, I'd also like to thank Mark and Richard uh, and David for putting the group together and Alice Meadows and Sarah Andrus that have overseen the Wiley Science Advisors. Thank you.